So island biogeography and its importance in world regional geography was the theme of the first part. And I'd like to explain in a broader context why I think island biogeography is important for, again, beyond just the islands. It's not just about the islands. Because what we see today in how the world is created and how humans are reshaping the world in which we live, habitat fragmentation is happening the world over. And when we build a road or when we create these massive fences, what we're essentially doing is we're dividing these large chunks of habitat. And habitat is increasingly fragmented. Urbanization becomes one key factor in that cities are essentially no-go zones for large mammals. And we've made it so that many species are just obviously not welcome within the city. Agriculture is another area. We have these massive fields where we're saying this is for one particular species, be it corn, wheat, soy, or whatever, and we're carefully trying to cultivate that one species, but at the exclusion of all other biodiversity. So urbanization and agricultural fields have profoundly reshaped the physical environment, and as humans have extended our reach towards just about every place on Earth, that's created chunks of little island fragments. And as we can see with this graphic below, what we're really looking at is some species prefer to be, if we're looking at forested interiors, they want to be in the deep parts of the forest and other animals live on the fringes. But as you fragment particular habitats, you also sometimes don't just decrease the, the range of the species by a particular amount, but sometimes it's much more than you actually would think for a particular road in this particular example. So I also want to show a few other ways in which we can look at an habitat fragmentation and island biogeography. Here we see places that look essentially not very settled by humans, and yet think like an animal. What types of places, what could you live in this type of environment? What would be the risks? This is, again, for larger animals especially, this is not a, neither of these are very conducive, the top picture nor the picture off to the left. And then you look at the picture on the bottom right. This is one that has been specifically designed and tailored for cr creating corridors so that animals can be able to go from one chunk of a habitat to another. And that dispersal, it's not just about letting them go to different places, it's about allowing the species to really be able to ecologically expand and then maintain their vitality of a genetic pool on both sides of that particular corridor. That becomes very, very critical. And so I'll send you some links as well with bridges and how habitat bridges can be quite important. Again, back to my trip to Roger Williams Park Zoo. I saw this snake and because it is the Christmas season they put some Christmas decorations in the cages of all, all the animals. The elephants and giraffes loved some of the things that they were receiving and got to see some wild hogs rip open their Christmas box. It was, it was quite entertaining. But this snake, one thing I've realized I wouldn't put something foreign in the habitat of a snake because he was giving this particular Christmas chain the death stare for minutes. We were just waiting for him to blink, but he was like ready to pounce on that thing. So great entertainment here. But I wanted to look at the species and specifically its distribution. These timber, timber rattlesnakes, indigenous to New England, but you can also see that their range is shrinking and shrinking tremendously. Now what do they attribute this to? Habitat destruction. Urbanization, it's not listed there, but it's still one of the key things. Road mortalities, sporting hunting, commercial logging, and, and other wide ranges of diseases. Although this isn't a very prevalent species, and most people aren't going to get too saddened by the loss of snake species, they're not being completely eradicated or in other words, they're, they're not extinct, but from Rhode Island specifically, they have been extirpated. Now, what is the word extirpation? 
it's essentially a local extinction. The best example I can think of this would be looking at the cougar or the mountain lion. Again, I went as a graduate of Penn State University, and we were the, our turn, nickname was the the Nittany Lions, and the University of Vermont. They're the catamounts. All of these are different names. The mountain lions, catamounts. These are names for the cougar. But when we look at the the spread of where cougars are today, they're not found at all in the eastern part of the United States. In fact, sometimes people have referred to them as the ghost cat because there were always these legends of ty of big cats lurking and it, it captured the imagination kind of like a Bigfoot type of ethos around it. And with this idea, you know, we can just see that no, the cougar is not extinct. But for all intents and purposes, if you live in the eastern part of the United States, yes, it, it absolutely has been eradicated and extirpated from our territories. Something to consider in terms of how we want to look at our ecology. Why did it, was it able to persist in the western part of the United States and not the eastern part of the United States? Several things that we can see. Where is the bulk of the United States population? Two-thirds of the U.S. population is on the eastern side of the Mississippi River. Then we look up and down the Great, Great Plains and the, the Midwest. These are some of our key areas for agricultural expansion. Cities, agriculture. Those aren't going to be places you're going to want a, a mountain lion or a cougar. And that led towards massive hunting parties taking down the cougar and essentially led towards its extirpation from the eastern part of the United States. Let's look at one other species. The bison. These were some from Roger Williams Park Zoo. And while I was there, I was looking at the particular banner, letting you know where they are, where they were. And you can see that they have almost been completely wiped off of their native historic range. And you can, I mean, human settlement, it makes perfect sense. These massive herds of buffalo are, well, bison technically, but a lot of people still refer to them as buffalo. It's a powerful force. If you've ever been in a place like Yellowstone National Park where, where they do still roam, they are tremendously powerful beasts that really have no regard for humans in the sense of, you know, I don't care if it's your road, I'm still going to walk across it and take my, take my time. That's... It jars with our concept of what we own the land as we see it. And the bison is, see, is seen sometimes by people as an infringement on that. They were hunted into massive extinction. And also some people, they, did, they just didn't want them in areas settled by people. It prevents urbanization. And so, again, eradication from a lot of those areas has led towards the local extirpation of the bison from a good range of these spots. And if you look at where the bison is today, they're islands. These are islands of bison population that without human intervention, they wouldn't be able to genetically disperse one population to the next. And cutting the size of a, pop a local population, once you get a population below 50, it's very difficult to be able to maintain that and the genetic diversity drops and lots and lots of issues with that. So here's another map, again not the highest resolution, but of that of those different fragments of where we can find bison today. Another one, here's the red wolf behind a cage and this is just a little tip on one peninsula in North Carolina where we can find this particular species. But where did it used to be? As we see from this particular one, it mentions it originally roamed throughout Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania all the way to Texas. That's quite a wide range, but it's currently only found in the eastern part of North Carolina. And again, not just the eastern part of North Carolina, a very, very small part of that. That tells you a little bit about some of the species that have been eradicated from major regions. And again, the wolf was seen very much as a threat to human habitation, civilization, and our 
how we wanted to preserve things. Now I want to end on one particular note, a species that had been threatened but has come back in, in a wide range. And that's the bald eagle. In fact, a species that was once considered quite endangered, but now very minimal concern. Part of it had why it was endangered, as it says here, the bald eagle populations plummeted in the 40s, 50s, when DDT was introduced. The pesticides worked its way up the food chain, becoming concentrated in top predators, including bald eagles. This counted the eagles to lay eggs with brittle shells that could not survive long enough to hatch. But the bald eagle is something we care about. It's a symbol of American pride, American nationalism. We weren't allowed, about to let the bald eagle go extinct. And there were massive efforts to save these, these majestic creatures. But not every creature has that kind of advocacy for it. Because of that, there is a strong difference between what animals are protected and what animals are saved. And again, I just would like to rem remind us, when we talk about this kind of habitat fragmentation, the key idea is simply this. It isn't just about the islands, when we talk about island biogeography. Because on the world we live in today, all habitats have been fragmented. And so what we start seeing is on the continents, island biogeographical issues happening at a smaller scale, and again, without being surrounded by water necessarily, but being surrounded by highways, freeways, farms, agricultural equipment, industries, any signs of human habitation that is, hab that is fragmenting the native range of many other species. Thank you very much.